tune in their votes after an 11th hour change to electoral laws. Housing, the cost of living and national security dominated the election campaign, but what were the issues that slipped under the radar? And we'll look at how the humble democracy sausage became an Australian electoral icon. Joining me on the panel, former New South Wales Liberal MP and former party treasurer, Michael Yabsley. Good to see you, Michael. Helen. Uh, former Labor Deputy Prime Minister and National President of the Labor Party in Sydney tonight, Wayne Swan. Good to see you. Good evening. Uh, we have Ke in Cairns tonight, Chair and Co-Founder of Deadly Inspiring Youth Doing Good, Samara Jost. Great to see you, Samara. Which way, which way? <laughs> we'll know tomorrow night. And partner at communications firm SEC Newgate, Faye Akendoyini, zooming into the seat at the last minute. Thanks for coming along, Faye. Hi, Ellen. And you can join us on Twitter using the hashtag the drum, and we're on Facebook. Well, the finish line is in sight, with voters heading to the polls tomorrow. And for those stuck at home with COVID, there was some welcome news this morning. Urgent changes have been made to electoral laws to ensure all voters in COVID isolation can vote over the phone and avoid a fine. But the Australian Electoral Commissioner says the emergency measure will not be a smooth process. We're effectively reading out the ballot paper. Uh, on the telephone to people. So can I urge people to be prepared when they phone in, have looked at the ballot papers online on our website. Um, you'll see when you when you register that the, the ballot papers are there for people to look at. Be prepared rather than um, going in clueless and asking our staff to read out entire ballot papers. It's going to be, an, it's an emergency measure. It will be lumpy and it will really help if people do some preparation. It's a bit scary, lumpy. And while most will be voting tomorrow, it's likely a record number will have already cast their ballot. Here are the latest pre-polling figures in orange compared with 2019 in blue. Back then, there was a longer pre-polling period in which 4.77 million people voted. This year, with still a day to go, 4.61 million people had voted. And if that trend continues, we can expect well over 5 million ballots, both pre-polling and postal votes, to be cast before tomorrow. Pre-poll has been running at a greater rate than the last election. Something like about 40% of Australians voted either pre-poll or by post. This election looks like we'll hit uh, the 50% mark. Uh, you know, I think yesterday was the largest single day of pre-poll in Australia's history. We took 743,000 votes just yesterday. I think today is on track to be bigger. We uh, appear to be heading towards a voting period uh, rather mm. than a voting period. OK, so just to be clear, because I just mucked that up, 50% have voted, that's because 5 million did pre-polling and 3 million did postal. Let's continue. While some voters have been struck down by COVID, so too have some crucial polling booth staff. Now, the majority of all 7,000 polling places will be fully operational, but there are concerns that at least 15 venues, mostly in remote parts of Western Australia, South Australia and Queensland, may go unstaffed tomorrow. We've met with um, emergency services uh, from all over Australia and they've sent out messages to their staff asking them to work for us. We've uh, messaged um, uh, education departments in the affected states. Uh, the Chief of the Defence Force and the Secretary of Defence authorised the sending of a message to defence reservists to come and work for us. Just to be clear, not as uniformed personnel, but just part of our workforce. We've gone to community groups um, all over Australia asking people to step in um, we are we're really pleased with the response, but it's changing on a minute by minute basis because as fast as we plug a gap, uh, people are also falling out. Okay, Samara. So they're down. Um, there were seventy six booths in danger of not opening yesterday, down to fifteen, and they're places like near where you are, Cow and Yama on the Western Cape. That's within the seat of Leichhardt. Every votes are important, but Leichhardt's also a marginal seat. Um, it just seems extraordinary breathtaking that you've got all these um, remote Indigenous communities and there's a real danger that they could be denied the vote. 100%. But this is the thing, right? We ha have known the challenges of remote voting. We know the challenges of being able to uh, support and, and empower Australian citizens, irrespective of where they live. Um, that they have a right to vote. What we have failed to do, or what the Australian Electoral Commission has failed to do, is really provide a 
different kind of service, you know, meet the uniqueness of those locations and uh, empower a community to ensure that they, they, they have an opportunity to exercise their, their Australian rights. Hmm. And so when you look at it, I mean, I'm not sure it's Cow and Yama, but there was one Indigenous community, Fran T Kelly was telling me about, where if their polling place doesn't open, it means a couple of hundred people have got to travel between four and six hours to a polling place. I mean, how likely is that, 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 that a community would be able to organise to transport people in that way? Uh, communities barely have their own transport to get around in the community themselves, let alone 400 kilometres. Uh, you can't expect people to be able to uh, just solve the problem for themselves when it's a failure of a system, a failure of a structure. The, these, it's, it's our Australian Electoral Commission's responsibility to ensure that we are effectively and really delivering fair voting. Hmm. Uh, Wayne, that is Kawanyama, I'm told, where people would have to drive all that way. I mean, given the background Certainly. in this country, right? 1967, uh, where, you know, under the, that, the section of the Constitution... Sorry, I've got a bit of cross-talk in my ear here, if we could just deal with it. Um, sorry, let me just pop it out. It wasn't until 1984 that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people gained full equality with other e electors in the, under the Commonwealth Electoral Act. I mean, that, there's some real sensitivity with not getting this right. Oh, absolutely. And I don't think that the Electoral Commission should escape scrutiny for it. But let's celebrate something, that we in this country do make it easy to vote. We don't set up barriers, but unfortunately we have one of those barriers here now. Uh, Pretty and it shouldn't predictable, have Wayne. Well, absolutely. So I think they've got difficult questions to answer. But the whole uh, idea of voting on the telephone or postal voting um, or pre-polling uh, has been enthusiastically embraced uh, by Australians over a period of time. And I think that's terrific, because if we can keep our rates of voting up uh, and get more people to participate in our democracy, we won't have some of the problems. You, you have in, say, a country like the United States where they have voluntary voting and they make it harder for people to vote, to even lodge a vote, to get on the roll. So we've got to get all these things right. We've done a pretty good job over the years, but we've seen some cracks here. We've just got to deal with them. Mm. Michael, I noticed that the independents, particularly in Kuyong, Dr Monique Ryan, are claiming credit, saying that she had threatened uh, to take the Australian Electoral Commission to court, to federal court, um, in order to ensure that uh, people with COVID uh, could vote, so that the deadline for when you got COVID was pushed way back, right? Um, so that more people could vote. And this affects 200,000 people. She's claiming credit for that, saying the government was flat-footed. I think there might be a few people claiming credit for it, and particularly as there seems to be a, 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 a solution, albeit perhaps to a problem that shouldn't have arisen, and a solution that is that is very late in the day. Look, it's it's a you know it's it's a, a temporary blemish on the on the operation of the democratic system, but I I think it has been sorted out. Um, the Electoral Commissioner looks like a, a calm, collected man to me. Looks like the sort of person you'd want to have on board in the event of a mid-air crisis. And I think he's had his equivalent of the mid-air crisis over the last couple of days. So, look, let, let's hope you know, tomorrow unfolds without a hitch. Well, I think the problem here is that they were warned by Don Farrell, uh, our spokesman on this some days ago. I'm just pleased it's fixed. Hmm, hmm, hmm. How hard is it going to be with all these people having voted on the night, Wayne, to work out who has won in really tight contests? Oh, I don't... Well, if there's a really tight contest, wherever they voted won't be the, the but question. But is pre-polling counted on the night? Well, some, some of the pre-polls will, will be counted, as I understand it. Uh, and I, I don't think we're going to see a vast divergence between pre-poll on the one hand oh, and okay. people voting on the day. Because you have 50%, voting, so that, yeah... yeah. Postal voting, however, has traditionally been seen to be uh, slightly different, less representative of voting on the day. Mm. But postal voting has also expanded dramatically. So that, that may not be as true as it has been in the past, that it's sort of skewed one way. Mm. So I think we'll get a pretty good, good idea mm. about what's likely to happen uh, on the night. Mm. Faye, I like living in a country where um, the big debate on the night is... Australians will not be disenfranchised. We don't have those debates here. And the Australian Electoral Commission, that we love and adore and have a lot of pride in, had jolly well better get it right. 
I, I love our sense of entitlement. It's wonderful and it's what makes us a special country. I think we do um, elections better than any other country in the world in terms of participation, in terms of access. Um, there are, for, what, 99% of us, actual um, the ability to cast our vote of the 17 million, and then there's this 1% that is truly challenged. Um, and the, that's the bit that the Electoral Commission seems to have been found themselves flat-footed. But, you know, there's other countries where people don't vote their entire lives. They don't have the opportunity and we should celebrate the fact that we have a system that has invented the modern voting system to be as fair as it is. Yeah. Mm. Now, if you do find yourself in a position of having to vote by phone, there are a couple of steps you need to go through. So I'm going to walk you through it. The first thing's first. You must have tested positive after 6pm last Friday. Then you need to register. Either go to the AEC website, shown here, or call 132326. You will be asked to provide evidence of a positive COVID test and you'll be given a registration number. Don't panic, it's actually not that hard so far. It's only one phone call. Once you've got that, you'll be able to phone up and vote, either today before 6pm local time or tomorrow between 8am and 6pm local time. Michael Yavsley, just before we move on, I want to imagine that you and I are sitting there and we've got, we're getting paid, I don't know, $20.33 an hour to take people's votes. And we start reading out <laughs> the Senate paper and we say, do you want to vote above the line or below the line? And they say below the line. And look at this. Pat, this is the New South Wales. This is below the line. We'd have to... <clears throat> Ellen, I'm, I'm, assuming, <laughs> I'm assuming you and I would be guilty of a criminal offence yes. if we gave someone a bit of a nudge to say... For the about, love of God, above vote the line. Vote above the line. Please vote above the line. Yeah. So yeah, Can I mean this, this 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 could this could take a long time. This could. This, imagine reading it again. Who was the second one? No, no, I'm not reading that again. <laughs> I'm not reading that again. And one quick other one, Wayne. We've been hearing stories coming in that when people vote, let's just say they vote above the line, and let's say in your case you wanted to vote for the Labor Party first, and the sixth person that you voted for might be the UAP because you're thinking in your mind, well they're the people I like I like the least. In fact. One, two, three, four, five, six. You should really like all those candidates. The people you don't like, you shouldn't vote for above the line. Isn't that right? Well, but, but these, these are the rules. Yeah, right? But do you understand that people yeah. are misunderstanding and thinking that their sixth vote... Do you understand me, Michael? Their yeah. sixth yep. vote is for the person they like the least. No, no, it's for the person they like the sixth most. Yeah. Can you just give me a hit on that? So well, I, look, only... Uh, my, my reaction to that is probably exactly what Wayne has said. I mean, this is... Since this, the tablecloth first mm. appeared, remember, you know, whichever mm. election that was, um, and it was called a tablecloth because it was the size of a tablecloth, mm. and I think it's been condensed down a bit. Um, but bearing in mind that this was all meant to, to simplify the system, mm. and for those who vote above the line, and we hope especially those who are getting the telephone call tomorrow, <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, that works fine. But you, know, but, you, as... but you vote for the people that you like. You don't have to put any people that you don't like above the line. If you don't like the Greens, don't give them six. If you don't mm. like UIP, yes. don't give yeah, them yeah. six. Yeah. Give somebody who's left aligned, if you're a left voter, right aligned if you're a right voter, that's how you vote above the line. But I'm sure that those people who uh, anticipate doing this mm. will have thought very deeply about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because... below, below the line is, is certainly the thinking person's way of voting. Yeah. Yes. Well, you could turn that on its head. <laughs> <laughs> you need your head what, you, to what, are you, what are you saying about people who <laughs> vote below the line? Oh, there are well, it takes a long time to start with. <laughs> <laughs> They're dedicated citizens. Those that do make it to a polling booth tomorrow will be largely making the decision based on what we've seen over the last six weeks, what's been talked about by each party, what the media have focused in on and some unexpected events that seem to have taken over the campaign. The number one topic around the kitchen tables of Australians right now is cost of living pressures. Everything's gone up. It's fuel, food. Can't even breathe without it costing. Mortgages going up, um, petrol going up. I don't think that wages sort of increase in line with actually what you pay. I sympathise with Australians as they face higher cost of living pressures. Of course I do. 
and that's why we've provided the relief in the budget that is the function of our strong economic plan. I want to take pressure off the cost of living by having cheaper electricity prices, by having cheaper childcare. Fears are building that China is laying the groundwork to build a military facility in Solomon Islands. That is alarming. Dramatically detrimental to Australia's security interests. We don't want our own little Cuba off our coast. Their foreign minister should be on the next plane to Solomon Islands. And there is no intention whatsoever, Mr Speaker, to ask China to build a military base in Solomon Islands. The Prime Minister of Solomon Islands has made it very clear that they are not accepting of any base in the Solomon Islands. They are not. I think any reasonable person looking at the situation can see that this has been a conspicuous failure of Australian policy. We are in a housing crisis. There's absolutely no rentals in town. More and more homes are being bought for business purposes to be renting out on the short-term rental market. Property for profit rather than property for shelter. Everybody in Australia knows that we've got a housing crisis and that housing affordability has got worse under Scott Morrison, not better. What Labor have been very clear about is they have a share in your home and so as your home value increases, they're making money off you. Well, super for housing, what do you think? I think it'll be a very popular move. If it's OK to raise your super for this, what else will there be down the track? Now interest rate rises are about to be part of the pain. For the first time in 11 years, the Reserve Bank has increased interest rates. They've made it very clear that it's been international factors that have been driving up inflation. A lot of households are really beginning to struggle already before the rate rises flow through. Australians have been preparing for this for some time. You work so hard to get where you are and it's like tough luck. Uh, Good luck repaying it if you can't sell your home. Whichever unlucky duck wins the May 21 election, mm -hmm. they are going to have this problem, which is high inflation, wages growth nowhere near 6%. So while the cost of living, home ownership and security in the Pacific dominated days of this election, other issues barely seem to register in the national consciousness. Just in any particular order, um, feel free not to answer the question. Faye, answer some other question. Um, these politicians, or former politicians, just ignore that instruction. Um, um, skilled migration. At the same time that we're talking about negative wages, we ha we're not really talking about the fact that employers cannot get enough workers. Surely the minute this campaign's over, we're going to start talking about skilled migration and that's going to be a prickly conversation. Oh, but it's a conversation we have to have. I mean, it's the aspiration of skilled migration. The reality is it actually hasn't delivered on the policy that it was supposed to, the economic benefits, because there's a bit of a tag-along effect that's been allowed to happen. So you might get one person who get, enters on the skilled migration, then they bring family and others who aren't skilled, and then we take on the same cost. But at the end of the day, we're a nation whose economy depends on immigration. We have, you know, backwards actual domestic birth rates. So we need the best and the brightest we can possibly attract from around the globe to come to Australia. If we don't do that, we're, we're dead in the water. Mm. But how hard a conversation is that to have, Samara? When, I'll talk to Samara now, but when you've got youth unemployment, right, and you've got negative wages growth with all those other issues. 100%. I think that we young people never make <laughs> really any kind of d discussion at the forefront when it comes to election time other than that we're asking questions and what we're trying to push for it is always then pushed to the wayside. What young people are vo want to vote on is pushed to the wayside. We talk climate justice. We want, you know, those kinds of for pushing the boundaries kind of policies that are about our future, that are about the longer term gains, uh, are nowhere to be discussed. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think? Um Climate hasn't been a big discussion. Is it because it's been settled, um, in a sense, between the both major political parties are saying, all oh, right, we'll, we'll get to net zero well, by 2050? I've, 
I think it has been a big issue. Has it? I, well, I, I, I think I, I, I think it had. This is when I when I heard that comment earlier today that climate change hadn't got a look in. I agree. Um, I was I was left scratching my head. I'd have thought. And look, I'm sure there'll be there'll be you know various organisations organisations out there analysing how every minute of every day of the six week campaign was was allocated. But I I would bet that climate change will be up there somewhere. Mm. I think there are a whole lot of other things that, that haven't got a look in that should have got a look in. But as we know, um, political campaigns make for a very crowded stage. And, you know, we're left with this fairly unedifying spectre of, of jingles and slogans and, you know, really third-rate uh, television and, and radio no, ads. No, we, we get a lot of airtime talking about a, a, a lot of issues. People have heard enough about um, trans people in Australia to last them a lifeline, I would have thought. Wayne, you, it's interesting that you've got the perception, you've that, you've got the perception that climate change well, has been discussed. The single biggest detailed policy that the Labor Party has published for this campaign is our climate policy. The, very, the single biggest program, our clean energy program, it has been the centrepiece of everything we've said and argued through the campaign. Okay, now, we've, done, we've, done, we've done aged care in that detail too, but climate is a huge issue in this campaign and, and it is having a huge consequence in terms of voting patterns, particularly in some of those safe Liberal uh, areas where the Teal candidates are. But yeah. well, it's a big issue in regional Australia in terms of renewables and the transition from fossil fuels. So, Samara, what are you hearing? Well, there's nothing really... It, the, the, it remains to go, well, where's the actual really pushing the boundaries policies? We're talking net zero by, uh, you know, 50% 2023. Hmm. So you're, you're, you're looking next year. You're, you're, you know, 2030 you're talking about. You're talking about 2030. I mean, we are, we, we are... That's right. So you're looking for more action than what the, what the parties have put forward? Major parties have put forward. That's right. The Greens, the Greens are progressing this and pushing some really interesting policies. Uh, what, where's our major parties following the track? Mm, mm, mm. Um, Faye, you're rolling. Let's be your... progressive. Let, what... Let's push some boundaries. Why are you rolling your eyes on that one? I mean, we, we've, we've got the what on um, 2050. The question is the how. How do we get there between now and here? That's exactly right. And I mean, you, if you're never responsible for delivering, you can talk till the cows come home. But if you're actually going to be responsible for implementing, then you actually have to develop policies that balance the needs of the broader community. And I know it's boring and I know it's not as exciting as being able to say, listen, we're all here for the future. But I mean, to Wayne's point, Labor has released some really detailed, smart policies about how to turn our laggard, you know, a, adoption of the 2050 into a competitive advantage for Australia, to harness some of the positive natural resources Australia has and actually allow us to participate in the global economy on this stuff. So to say that it hasn't been there is just not true. It's the fact people don't want to listen to the detail. They just want to listen to the slogans. And, so, and you know, you get the election that you pay attention to. Well, that's interesting. Ellen, I, I, I just, just offer the point. I mean, the... The, t the truth is that, you know, those of us who are having this discussion tonight, many of the people who are watching it are, are part of the political class or an extended part of the political class. And, you know, what Faye has said, and Faye is nodding in agreement, um, there, there, there are many people for whom, as hard as I find it hard to believe, because this is the sort of thing that, you know, makes mm. me excited, as, as far as I find it hard to believe, there are many people who zone out, a number of people who are saying, oh, let's get this election out of the way, I'm bored, stupid, every time I turn the, the television on or you know, look at social media, it's just politics, politics, politics. And I think that goes to the heart of why a lot of, a lot of people who zone out are the, the ones who are most likely to say, I haven't heard what I wanted to hear. OK, well, let me just run two things by, by you folks and then, and then I want to move on to, to Indigenous Affairs. It was a great debate on NITV. OK, first of all, there's some pretty simple numbers, right? Everybody says there's a sea of red ink, right? There's deficits. doesn't matter who wins the election on Saturday. Uh, the election next financial... The budget next financial year will have a deficit of about $80 billion. And we are expected to believe that whoever is the Treasurer next week in this country is going to give the big tick to those third round tax cuts that are going to put us that well, are going to cost 16 billion dollars got the big tick 
They're already legislated. But that, they're but already she, going to be delivered. Well, didn't and I remember Paul Keating said LAW law tax cuts? And they're he already didn't go there, legislated by the go current government. They have been legislated and supported but, by but Labor. If, but if you want to, yes. Yes, but if you want to talk transition, if you want to talk deal. No, I don't. I want to talk about how on earth anyone who has been paying even half attention wouldn't say to themselves, gee willikers, Faye, $80 billion in the red and we're going to have $16 billion worth of tax cuts. So somebody earning middle to income, right, middle income to higher income can get an $9,000 tax cut in this country. Surely any treasurer is going to scratch their head and say, I don't know about that. Well, that debate's been had, and it's not on the agenda for this election, but the agenda that is there for this election will be how do we transition our economy into the future, keep it growing, and pay down debt. I'm a simple soul. I want the answer to that one, Faye. I mean, this is one of the problems we've got with politics at the moment. Politics and policies don't necessarily live in the same room. Um, <laughs> You've, you've got a situation in which people don't want to talk about taxes. Talking about taxes is death in a ca political campaign, even if it's a reasonable tax, even if it's a tax that actually shifts the structure of things towards more fairness in the long term. There's always going to have to be a loser and nobody wants to talk about losers. Mm. OK, Faye. Uh, Samara, how hard is it to get a builder to come build a house for you in Cairns? Is it virtually impossible like it is everywhere else? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Absolutely. OK. Right. -o. So on that, on, on that note, Michael, right, anyone who's trying to build a house, anyone who's trying to do a renovation, anyone who's trying to build back a house after a flood or a bushfire knows that there's inflation in the, in the cost of doing that, right? Um, building costs, timber prices in the year to September last year were up 12%. Steel was up 24%. Carpets were up about 4%, right? So everything's getting more and more expensive. And at the same time, anywhere, anyone you ask will tell you, no, I can't get a builder. And at the same time, state and federal governments are going to apparently push ahead with $218 billion worth of infrastructure spending in the next five years, which could only make the shortages of labour and materials worse. Surely to goodness, even if you're only half paying attention, you say they can't build all that public infrastructure, they'll have to slow down. Well, I'm sitting next to the bloke who used to be Federal Treasurer, um, therefore I'll happily work on the basis that he knows more about this than I do. <laughs> but what I would say, Ellen, to you, to go back to the, to the, the, the debate a, a few minutes ago of a, of a deficit of $80 billion, three Gina Reinhardt's could get rid of that deficit with $10 billion to spare. Now, that's just a flippant way of saying... What are you suggesting we socialise, Jim? No, no, no. no. <laughs> this is, well, that this would, is becoming that would, a very that would interesting never, That program. would never work. No, what, I'm, what, I'm, what, I, what I am saying is that an $80 billion deficit mm. is, I believe, a manageable deficit, deficit for Australia to have. $240 billion worth of infrastructure spending. I think we'd be doing something wrong if we didn't have that in the Ford budget. And, and, so the, the, the question is, you take these amounts in isolation, right. and I know they look very scary, but, I mean, you've got to put them alongside the strength of the Australian economy, which mm. might have, you know, there might be you know, bumps in the road, but... I think those, those if, you, if we just <coughs> ring fence those two discussions, the deficit and $240 billion to spend on infrastructure, mm. I think you've got a very manageable proposition. Two twenty billion. The only thing I'm talking about, Wayne, is if you're trying to get a builder to rebuild your house in Lismore, <clears throat> or you're still waiting to rebuild after the fires, you'd probably quite like it if federal and state governments stopped sucking up all the, all the materials and the labour in this country. Well, is well, there an argument to slow it down? Just no, be real. not at all. Okay. If, if, if we want to grow our economy, if we want to be prosperous mm. uh, in the coming decades, then we've got to invest in the basic infrastructure that makes the show work. Mm. Now, whether that's transport, whether that's export facilities, or whether it's the energy transition, we have to attend to all of those things at once. And you will be selling those people in those towns short if we don't make the critical investments to grow the economy for the future, to produce the tax revenue, mm. uh, which then is, is invested in training our, our own people and so on. It's a virtuous circle. It's going and to be a frenetic it, five years, though, right? It's well, going to be well, a frenetic five years of building. But just bear in, bear in mind, I mean, around the world at the moment, we are going to be looking at labour shortages because, basically, people like Michael and I are getting out of the workforce. Uh, baby boomers are standing aside. Um, 
Uh, the, the world is splitting in terms of the way in which it relates to each other. People are, are setting up domestic industries, whereas once they would have been international. So we've got the prospects in the year, years ahead. If we actually get the energy factor right mm. and get the investment in renewable energy to actually drive an economy and drive domestic employment in new domestic industries, that will also mean a debate about labour supply, oh, which, you, which you highlighted before. Which is where we started. Well, when it comes to First Nations affairs, there was some discussion of the Indigenous voice to Parliament over the course of this campaign, but not much more than that. National Indigenous Television, NITV, can be thanked for delving deeper into the issue, though. They hosted a First Nations election special featuring Green Senator Lydia Thorpe and Labor MP Linda Burney. No one from the Coalition agreed to appear. The debate tackled a range of issues, but one major talking point was housing. What will your party do in government to resolve Aboriginal housing crisis once and for all? Well, as I said earlier, uh, one million homes and also to provide seven billion in capital grants over ten years to improve existing public housing. And we know a lot of our mob live in run-down public housing homes. We need the, to stop government selling off public housing um, and we need to invest in fixing what we already have but also building more. The point that I'd like to make first is if we don't fix up housing, forget the rest. So Labor has committed to renegotiating the Northern Territory Agreement um, and has committed $200 million on our stations in the Northern Territory. The other commitment that we have is $200 million across the country, which isn't a lot, but we understand that this has to be a high priority in every budget. Samara, it was like you were watching a different election campaign when you were looking at NITV because we have not seen that level of detail um, in, in the general coverage. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really, um, you know, when you watch that and you listen to it, you yeah. really kind of start to understand where... Uh, these parties are sitting, but also that, wow, gee, I wish I'd known, this, known a lot of this stuff earlier. Um, you know, for the general public and people who are not connected to First Nations issues, this stuff is, is not at the forefront for anybody. Um, and for blackfellas, well, gee, it, it just continues to perpetuate the same narrative of, well, I don't trust you for a government to do anything that's actually purposeful for us. And so, you know, we always get to the very last moment. Oh, yeah, we'll chuck this in there, by the way. Is that how it feels to you? And, and when a housing discussion um, really uh, radiates around uh, middle class people of a certain generation getting into housing and that discussion about um, Indigenous Australians and the desperate state of housing. Auntie Pat Turner asking that question there. She's coming at that from a health perspective. Everything starts with housing, yeah? Absolutely everything starts with housing. We know that even here in far north Queensland where one of the biggest sufferers of rheumatic heart disease, which is all stemmed from uh, housing, you know, poverty, the same sort of those issues that we live with in our home, these are preventable, preventable diseases that, well, because we don't have adequate housing, we don't have adequate, um, you know, our homes are, are run down, we're never going to be able to solve those issues, 100%. And um, preventable stuff, we're talking, you know, these things that can be solved long, long, long time ago, the things that have been eradicated long, long time in other places aren't being, don't have the same thing here because mm. we don't have ours. Mm. Mm, mm. Let alone being, you, can you imagine being in a remote community and you can't have a house because it costs them tenfold to actually send resources and building material go up, you know, up north. Mm, mm. The, the, the whole housing discussion, let's have that one. With a large field of independent candidates and a tightening of the opinion polls, election night could provide some surprising results. Now, normally at this point we'd be poring over election maps, but what if I told you our traditional electoral map is a little misleading? Here's the map from 2019. Look at all that blue. The Coalition romped to victory, except it didn't. In fact, the Coalition won the bare minimum, 76 seats, to form government. So now the boffins here at the ABC have reimagined the electoral map, that's Australia you're looking at, with these hexagons 
representing each electorate, removing the distorting effect of geography. And it shows how the last election wasn't much more closely won than you'd otherwise think. We wanted to understand a bit more about how the analysts pull all the numbers together on the night, so I snuck onto the set of the ABC's election night special to quiz election analyst Anthony Green. This is the main set where Lee Sales will be hosting, uh -huh. political guests on the left, and we're probing an animal crab over there. Okay. Now over here, we've got a big, um, David Spears will be doing all sorts of fabulous things and what numbers will be... What does the floor do? I think it does dance moves. It's like one of those things in the public movie. No, it's, um, they're, doing, they're doing some sort of augmented reality. Wow. Uh, and I what think. about this one? That's a few guests there talking. They're, they're doing analysis. And your spot? We've got this nice new map, which does Ooh. this. So you can sort of zoom in, and it allows me to do that now, so that's already exciting. Ooh, so, uh, that's very nice. Um, so that's the way it works, and it'll be coloured in during the evening. So this is going into the election. We've got 76 coalition seats, 69 Labour, one Green, and five others. That's the result of last election with the redistributions in two states taken account of. So that's our starting position for the Saturday night. How does the information get from our polling places to your screen? Look, um, the staff that run the polling place on the day, at the end of the night, they count the votes. They open the ballot boxes, reconcile the ballot papers against how many are issued, tally them up, phone that tally through, then they do an indicative preference throw, they phone that figure through, it goes into the Electoral Commission's uh, returning officer's office, they data entry the numbers, come through the computer to the Electoral Commission's computer, pumped out as a data file somewhere on the internet, which the ABC pulls in, reprocessed through our system, turn it into graphics. You always worry that getting the votes on the night. Yeah. Is that feed going to work? You know, it's like election night is like bungee jumping for intellectuals. You leap into the void tethered by a computer link. <laughs> when you see that first polling place arrive, you go, aha, something's coming in. So then you know the data's arriving. It gets trickier, obviously, uh, the narrower it gets. So if nobody gets 50% of the vote hmm. um, in a preferential voting system, uh, how, how does that work? The Preferential voting system is people, you get your lower house ballot paper. The you, green. The green one, the small one. You must number all the squares. Say that again. You must number all the squares. And one on more green. time. You must number all the squares <laughs> on your green ballot paper. OK, continue. Uh, they tally up all those first preferences. If one candidate has 50% of the vote, once you add, add all the polling places together, they've won. They've got over half of the vote. If nobody has over half of the vote, they exclude the candidate with the lowest votes they re-examine their ballot papers and distribute them to the next available preference. They give those votes to whoever yeah. the voter said they wanted second. And a big focus are these teal seats or other independent seats. Do you have any magic that you're doing or something extra that you're doing to help us understand on the night what's happening with those independent challenges? The two candidate preferred count by polling place is a really bad guide for how this new contest will work because the independent vote is cutting across a normal cleavage. You know, you're normally looking at this left-right divide and you've got this independent running on other issues and they're on, like, on this slope like this. Mm -hmm. So they take some votes off the Liberals, they take lots of votes from Labor. You get a different count and you get big swings out of that. So in a case like that, we'll be looking at the first preference vote of the Liberal candidate because we've got a history to compare it with. And if the Liberal first preference vote is well down, well under 50, they're in trouble. So that's what we're doing on those seats because the raw preference count that we get in these seats will be less reliable. This is terrifying. There's a spaceship here, there's, there's <laughs> computers, there's the whole... Uh, nervous, excited? What are you? By the time you get to election night, you're just ready for the for analysis. You just take the data. And the hard thing is trying to work out what these numbers mean. Good luck cutting through the noise. We'll be watching. Thank you. <laughs> Anthony Green, his big night coming up. Um, Faye, we're potentially, um, by the end of uh, tomorrow night, going to see the highest ever vote for third parties in this country. What does that tell us about Australia? Ah, oh, I think it tells us that democracy is alive and well. It means that people are engaged enough not to have thrown their <coughs> vote into a, the historical bucket. Um, it, it also tells us that, you know, the primary vote versus the two-party preferred is such a fascinatingly changed outcome. I mean, historically, by this time, um, we'd have two two sides of parliament, which would have a support base not starting with a four. Liberals, Liberal coalition have not had a primary vote that doesn't start with a four 
since 1946. And right now they're travelling in the 36, 37, 38. So that's got to be a concern for them. Labor commonly has a, a, a high 30s, best case scenario when it wins, low 40s, but it does better on preferences historically. But these independents, they're mm. a game changer. You don't know where they're going to go. You don't know if their preferences hold. You don't know um, if... And remember, it's, we're not just talking Teals. We're talking the Palm United type as well. So both extreme ends of that side of life. It's going to be fascinating. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Samara, what about you? Do you share that enthusiasm for election night? Do you like an election night broadcast? Oh, look, to be honest, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, <laughs> we'll just wait until see you wake up next day, start Sunday, uh, you know, Sunday morning and go, oh, yeah. No, no. That fella. Oh, yeah, <laughs> all right, cool. Um, it, to be honest, you, you know, you, sometimes you just got to make your vote and see whether we'll see where it all lands. Um, you can't hedge your, beds, hedge your, hedge your bets too much. Yeah, um, yeah. You're just going to... See, Samara, Take it as it comes. Go Sa with the roll. Samara is our reality check. Yeah, she sure is. Uh, you know, Samara, you know, what, what you're saying is what I was saying about all of those people out there who think th this is all a bit of a drag. Let's get this over and done with and then life can go back to normal. Do you like the idea of these independents, Samara? Um, look, I think they provide a really interesting point of view and, and a really good challenge for our um, two major parties because I think they... They challenge them to think and go, you know, what are they actually saying? Um, there's been lots of yarns around, well, then how do you tell the difference between Labor and Liberals? Uh, you know, like, so there's a lot of, OK, just, well, I might just go this way because there's somebody different. Mm, mm. You never know. Like, you know, sometimes it's just people get us, have a sense of tired of the status quo, tired of the same old... Mm, same old, same old. Yeah, and th and that that sentiment alone can can change votes. What about that point about the um, potentially Wayne the lowest ever uh, vote for um, the major parties that they're in the 30s. I mean, the, the opinion polls for Labor, the primary vote, have got them at 31, 35 percent. No, no. When, I, look, I, I I don't think it's going to be radically different from last time when it comes to the, the primary votes for the parties. There's no doubt for both major parties, the primary votes have eroded over time. Mm. Uh, Faye's right to say that you know 38 for the Labor Party is not unusual, and the Conservatives have generally got in in, in the 40 plus. Uh, what is fascinating in this election is that is the change that is actually happening in the Liberal Party vote in super safe seats, uh, because that is a, a, a real, a real, a real change. I think in in the outlook, particularly for the Conservative side of politics, and with, the, with the, the Labor, yeah, with that. the Labor Party, we've always had the Greens mm. on one side. Then there's been the Labor Party on the other side of politics. There's been the Liberals, the Nationals, and now a new group of people who are saying to safe Liberal members. Uh, you know, you're not good enough on climate change, or you're not good enough, good enough on integrity, and we're going to take you on. So that can work. That could well fracture uh, into the future parts of, of the Liberal base if they can't resolve that contradiction, mm. uh, particularly in those two critical areas. At the same time, and we do need to move on. It will be fascinating to see uh, how much Australians are saying. Uh, the hell, uh, pox on both your houses, sure. and I'll and I'll and I'll vote for the independent. Or the and Palmer to what party, extent right? that yeah. they say, no, I want my community candidate. I don't want somebody who's been parachuted in by sure. one of the major parties, and you can all go to hell. And I'm going to vote for that local person I know. So oh, that'll be very interesting to see. It will. Uh, Samara's nodding away there. This is the part of the election campaign where the travelling schedules of the two alternate Prime Ministers really become frenzied. Morrison and Albanese are crisscrossing the country. The PM was in Western Australia this morning. That is a long, long way to go to a state where the Federal Liberal Party usually dominates. Albanese is in Tasmania, but this morning he was in Adelaide with Julia Gillard making a pitch for the marginal seat of Boothby. It's the part of the election where they are basically begging for our support. So when it comes time to wield our little pencils, we have one here from someone who voted early, over those green and white ballot papers, we want to know that they really, really, really want our vote. Jerry, you better yell! Show me the money! Jerry, 
Gary. You, my What you gonna do, Gary? Congratulations, you're still my agent. And, of course, it's not just the money. It's show me the leadership, show me the vision, make me believe you can create a better federation here. So with just hours to go before polls do open, it's time to start considering the various traditions of voting, which ones are unique to Australia and how they came to be. For more, we're joined by Emeritus Professor of Politics at La Trobe University, Judith Brett. Thank you so much. It's so lovely to see you. Can we start with the mystery of the very small pencil? Yes, I, look, I don't know when they became small. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that pencils were introduced quite early by William Boothby, who was effectively the Chief Electoral Officer of South Australia. I think we have a picture of William Boothby. Yes, we can show you. after whom Boothby was named. Because originally um, the ballot papers were to be marked with pen and ink uh -huh. and blotting paper was provided and they found, or well, Boothby did an experiment and he found that it took people, even very literate people, a long time to fill out their ballot paper because the first ballot papers, what you did was you crossed out all the people you didn't want right. and just left one. So by the time they dipped their pen, and, <laughs> and these are not fountain pens, you know, these are old... Oh, old quill and ink. Well, they're not quills. They're, yes, they're the old pens that I learnt to write with when he got <laughs> school, you know, when you had the inkwell on the desk. Um, and so he introduced pencils because that, that was quicker. That sped it up. Because one of the issues with um, these... when manhood suffrage came was how they... and the secret ballot was how they were going to actually get through the numbers of people without there being enormous queues. And mm. so the, prior to the pencil, there was then the invention... Um, of the of the polling booths, so, so these are the little people individual could, yeah, booths. Yeah, so six people could vote at once, rather than there being one person having to go into a room at a time. Which and, had it, been and, the it, initial. and at risk of turning this into a, a social a grade six social studies, which yeah. it, it sort of is, but that's okay. Um, Boothby was quite an amazing chap. He was the one who came up with. We'll write the names down on the paper, put a square beside them, and you just put a cross beside them. Yes, well, he like. then decided... He invented the idea well, there's, of, of, the, of the cross in a box so that Very you didn't nice. have to cross the names out. And you just had to put a one because you only, it was first past the post in those days. But the other one, and it was invented about the same time in Victoria by a guy called Chapman, was the idea that you didn't bring to the ballot box, which has been what had happened previously, the name already written down of who you wanted to vote for and hand it to the returning office. Oh, so because... people would just bring it in their pocket? Yes, and of course then what happened was the political parties would print them and they'd print them on coloured paper so you could see, so people who were bribing people with alcohol and things... Are you listening, Wayne? Are you listening could Martin? see who people had voted for because <laughs> that was the system in America. America had a secret yeah. ballot but actually it was very easy to see because the, the parties were quite well developed there compared with here and they, ha they provided the ballot papers for people. So the, the big breakthrough was the idea that the voter came into the polling booth empty-handed and everything they needed would be provided by the government with the ballot papers. Mm. Now, Samara, I find this thrilling, but as we've established, <laughs> I'm a nerd. Your job is to make young people enthusiastic about voting. How do you do that? Oh, look, it's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, <laughs> we're trying to do that. You know, we have to basically understand how our democratic system works in Australia because the reality is, is uh, like, I, to be honest, I graduated high school. I knew zero about how I was meant to vote and uh, what my actual citizen rights were to, you know, participate in an election. And... You know, so it's only been through a process of learning and a, and a process of advocating that you kind of actually start to understand what you've got to do. Mm. Um, teaching young people is a different story because uh, we're, we're doing that whole process. We're teaching young people about what that, what is the actual just kind of process, let alone how they actually understand what a policy is. How do they understand what preferential voting is? Uh, it's super complex and young people just don't understand that they have actual power. They actually have a power uh -huh. with that one vote. Yeah. And, and that's where you've got to start, right? It does matter and you mm. have power. Mm-hmm. 
because otherwise you just get this sense of helplessness and hopelessness you know you know we're just consistently bombarded with all these messaging and parliament and parties and whatever they think that nobody actually unnecessarily no I shouldn't say nobody not a lot of young people um, understand what actually the government does for them sometimes so you know it's that education as well how does it all play into how does it affect my day-to-day -day, everyday life mm. uh, Judith I think it's interesting also that as in Australia I mean uh, Americans are often horrified to discover we have compulsory voting yeah. um, and and we are happy with our preferential system confusing though it is that the, the society says to us, well, put down who you want to win and at the same time, put down with your other numbers who you're prepared to put up with. That's right. <laughs> yes, I think that you end up with the person who's least disliked yes. rather than most liked. Wonderful. Yes, and it's interesting because preferential voting hasn't been much copied in other parts of the world. No. You know, it's some... Um, I think it's a terrific system mm. because it means that there's more more possibilities in play. And what does it say about Australia? Well, look, I think if you combine it with um, compulsory voting, what it says about Australia is that Australia is what I would call a majoritarian democracy. Mm -hmm. we, wa we care more about the fact that the majority of people support the government than we're worried about the very minor encroachment on our liberties by the fact that we're compelled to vote. And so that's what I think it, it says about us. Mm -hmm. um, and contrast that with the US. Well, the US, its political culture is much more um, concerned with rights than our political culture was. Like, I went through all the debates uh, in, the in the colonial and the state and the federal parliaments on compulsory voting because it was first floated in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and what was striking about the Australian debates was that nobody ever raised philosophical objections. They were all practical objections. Too many people won't vote. And so it'll be too much. It'll be too onerous to chase them down. How, how much should we fine them? <laughs> right. You know. Not, if, not should we force them, but no. But how would a, we fine the people and who the, don't? In, in the final debate, which was in 1924, one person objected on a philosophical basis, and he was a member of the Labor Party, and he said, "Look, I've just been an anti-conscriptionist, and I object to the state telling you to vote." But I'm a member of the Labor Party and Caucus is supporting it, so that's how I'm going to vote. <laughs> <laughs> so there we have it. <laughs> Faye, I, I kind of adore our system. Do, do you have the same um, nostalgia and enthusiasm for our imperfect democracy? Oh, I do. I do. And I have absolute respect for it as well. I actually think we are so fortunate. I mean, I've worked in political elections all over the world. Um, and in some countries, just the right to show up on the day, just the right mm. to be on the roll is people give blood for. Um, so we've got a system that says, A, it's, you don't have to roll out the vote. You are, you are forced to come and vote. We're going to shove democracy down your throat whether you like it or not. <laughs> and then we're going to actually give you a system that says you have to th read the ballot paper and think about it for a nanosecond. You can still go donkey, but once every three to four years we ask for 20 minutes of your time to determine how you know, 24 million people can move forward in life. Because whether you vote or not, you're still going to have to live by the rules of the people who get elected. Mm. And, so, and, you and know. I, know, I know you're a great fan of the democracy sausage. Compare oh. that with what you saw on one occasion in America at a polling place, which was a pretty scary uh, racialised oh, yeah. incident. This is, this is again... It, I was born in Australia, brought up in Australia. It was, for me, gobsmacking. We were in um, uh, West Virginia, which is not, the, not as far away from the places as you'd think. Um, and because getting out the vote, actually showing up at the polling booth is a conscious decision, I was with some um, colleagues and we watched people in white hoods sit in the car park of a polling booth and really put the moxie on any African-American voter who showed up. Like, didn't physically stop them walking in, but really made them rethink their life choices. And that is what the so-called, you know, uh, democracy experiment of the US creates in their system. Yeah. So we are so lucky here. That does not happen in Australia. Yeah. You are 
you the worst thing that happens is you are bombarded by people in colourful t-shirts <laughs> thrusting mm. dead trees at you. <laughs> I mean, mm. The other thing that's liable to happen to you, Judith, very, very quickly, is uh, the offer of a democracy sausage. What is this about? Well, look, it's about... It, it... It's about a number of things, but one of the things is that it's possible because we vote on a Saturday, mm -hmm. which we've been doing, Labor introduced that in 1911. We have a choice about what polling booth we vote at, which is not the case in many countries where you actually, your registration is linked to a particular polling booth and that's where you're meant to turn up. We, polling booths are, are very often in public public schools or community halls where there's a fundraising committee that mm -hmm. sees, and fundraising has been going on I've got a photo in the 1920s of somewhere in Atherton and there's a, a street stall outside the community hall. Uh, and the portable gas barbecue. Yes, the the invent when the, was that invented? It, well, it's, it starts becoming widespread in, in, Victoria, in Australia in the 1980s and so lots of schools uh -huh. acquire them because they acquire them for their, you know, their parents and citizens meeting at the beginning of the year. They're yeah. using them at their fates. And so they wheel them out Perfect. on election day. And then the, the last bit was social media. The fact that when there was a choice and this group of young people constructed a social media site to advise people about the fair that was on offer at the various polling booths. All right, we've got less than a minute for each of our <laughs> gentlemen sitting here. Uh, Wayne Swan, I think Democracy Sausage is also about underfunded public schools and the need that to supply toilet paper and hand sanitizer and all the rest of it. Democracy Sausage or Democracy Cupcake, Wayne? Crucial question. Cupcake for me. Really? I'm not into the Democracy Sausage. Re even at Bunnings? Not even at Bunnings. All right. No. And you voted this election? Absolutely. Early? Pre-polled pre yesterday. You had something else to do tomorrow night? Well, it wasn't eight, <coughs> eight o'clock in the morning, so right. I wouldn't be doing a democracy sausage at eight o'clock. But True. And yeah. as federal president of the ALP, you're probably a little bit busy tomorrow. Yeah. OK. Michael Yapsley. Well, I voted early. I voted this morning. I took my dog to the dog-friendly polling booth in <laughs> King's Cross. He didn't vote, but I did. Um, <laughs> And, and they let you in with this dog? Th they they encouraged me to go in. Some, one of the one of the um, AEC officials even offered to hold hold my dog while I voted. Um, but I'm always intrigued. You know, voting voting early, as we've heard tonight, has certainly become rife. But I've always been intrigued by the old line: "Vote early, vote often," <laughs> <laughs> which is something I'm I'm sure Judith must have some insights about. <laughs> from her extensive knowledge of this whole area. Yeah. OK, really quickly, this is like Christmas for you, isn't it? Oh, it is. This is Christmas Eve. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very excited and can't wait for tomorrow. Really quickly, uh, Samara, this isn't Christmas Eve for you, is it, girlfriend? No, I'm going to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, that is all we have time for. Thanks to our panel, to Michael Gabsley, Wayne Swan. Thanks to Samara Joe, Faye Yakindoyeni and to our wonderful guest, Judith Brett. I'll be back on Monday night. Who knows what will happen? Have a lovely weekend. Go to the pub, watch the election coverage. Don't forget to vote. Good night.